Let us welcome Ms. Eileen Go, Associate Director of IT Security at the National University of Singapore, to present you with her presentation on the NUS Bug Bounty Program for learning, profit, and good. Over to you, Eileen. Okay, thank you, NC. My name is Eileen, NUS Bug Bounty Program Manager. I'm here today because I believe in the benefits of Bug Bounty Program. And I'm going to share with you uh, in the next 30 minutes on how to deliver an impactful bug bounty program. So I'm going to begin by sharing with you an inspiring encounter of mine in my bug bounty program. So for the purpose of this sharing, I'm going to change the name of the project manager and the system. So one day, Alan, the project manager, he was going about his daily operation. When he received this call from me, so I told Alan, Sacred system has been hacked and personal data has been extracted from his system. Next, I show Alan a video on how the personal data was extracted from his system step by step. Alan couldn't believe his eyes because all that he had provided for the bug bounty challenge is only the sacred system website address. Alan told me later on, Elaine, we are so glad that this is just a bug bounty challenge experience and the team is now convinced that a cyber attack is after all not that remote. It can happen to us, it can happen to our system. And he thanked me for the experience. And this experience of mine clearly illustrates the benefits of bug bounty. So bug bounty demonstrates the cyber threats. As the saying goes, seeing is believing. Is part spontaneous solution. Now, since the inaugural launch of NUS Bug Bounty Program in 2019, I was asked four common questions about Bug Bounty Program. First question, very often I was asked, Hey, Eileen, what is a Bug Bounty Program? Second question, they will ask, Why do you want to conduct Bug Bounty Program? And what's the difference between Bug Bounty Program and other security testing program that NUS has already adopted. You have vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, and red teaming. So why bug bounty program? Third, I was asked how to conduct a bug bounty program. And fourth, how do I measure the success of a bug bounty program? I'm going to share with you answers to this question in the next few slides. Question one, what is a bug bounty program? So you can think of a bug bounty program like a challenge that you put up. You ask the ethical hacker to find bugs on your system. When they find bugs on your system, you offer them a sum of money called bounty. And that's why the name, bug bounty. But besides offering them bounty, you might also want to consider naming these ethical hackers in your organization hall of fame. You want to thank them for finding bugs on your system and reporting them to you. That's very important because you will want to fix these bugs before the bad guys find them. Question two, what's the difference between bug bounty and other security testing program that we already have? For example, we adopted vulnerability assessment penetration testing, rate teaming. And why do we still want a bug bounty program? Does bug bounty program replaces all these programs? I'm going to use the pictures of these three treasure chest box to illustrate the difference. So you can think of vulnerability assessment and penetration testing just like this transparent treasure chest box. So the tester has knowledge of the system functions before they start the testing. And they also have keys to this treasure chest box. The keys here represent the user ID and password for various roles on the system. This tester will also refer to top 10 web application security risk checklist to find bugs on the system. For those who are interested, you can Google OWASP top 10 for more information on how to do the test. And for the testing, it's often 
done in the development environment. This is to address the business user concern on the impact of testing on the system confidentiality, integrity, and availability. What happened during the course of testing? The system service is unavailable, the system data get modified, and the system data get leaked. Now, the quality of vulnerability assessment and penetration testing is largely dependent on the skill sets of the contractor you engage. How about rate teaming? What is a rate teaming? You can think of rate teaming like this opaque treasure chess box. The tester do not have any knowledge of the system functions pyro to the testing, and they only have one key to your opaque treasure chess box. This one key represents the user ID and password to one of the system within your organization, and you up the challenge for them. You give them an important mission for this rate team tester. You tell them to compromise the crown jewel of your organization. This crown jewel can represent the most important system within your organization. For example, system that manages the user ID and password of your entire organization. Now, rate teaming tester will also refer to top 10 web application security risk checklist to find bugs on your system. In addition to that, they will also employ advanced attack tools and techniques referencing that of Meta framework. So advanced attack tools and techniques can, for example, include password brute forcing, privilege escalation, like escalating the privilege of a normal users to an administrator, it can include lateral movement, like jumping from one system to another system. Now, rate teaming, unlike vulnerability assessment and penetration testing, is conducted on a production environment. Again, the quality of rate teaming is dependent on the skill sets of contractor you engage for the testing. How about bug bounty? Bug bounty is just like this third treasure chest box, opaque treasure chest box with the light bulb. So what happened is that the ethical hackers, they do not have any knowledge of your system. Neither do they have any user, and, user ID and password to your system. All that they are given is just your system website address. But this does not stop the ethical hackers or the bug bounty hunters from researching about your system. Neither does it stop them from registering an account on your system. Bug bounty hunters are often very, very creative. Their testing approach is not limited to that of OWAP's top 10 and even the Meta framework. And very often, uh, bug bounty, you can think of it like a crowdsourcing concept. So what happens is that you leverage on the skill sets and the experience of a large pool of people to find bugs on your system. And that's why I've been asked, hey, Lynn, we have really finished fixing the bug for vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, and read teaming. Why do I still get bug during the bug bounty challenge? So my answer to that is that, hey, you see, bug bounty leverage on the skill sets of a large pool of experience. I mean, large pool of people for their skill sets and diverse experience. Whereas vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, and rate teaming are dependent on the skill sets of the few contractors that you have engaged. So in short, Bug Bounty doesn't replace these testing programs that you already have, but they are complementary. Third question, I was asked how to design or how to conduct a Bug Bounty program. So we'll begin by designing our desired Bug Bounty program. You can think of designing a bug bounty program like designing a restaurant menu. So first of all, you need to think of the type of bug bounty program that you want for your organization. Do you want it to be a public bug bounty program? One that you'll be sharing the bug reports with the members of the public. The bug report will consist of what is the bug and how do they exactly find the bugs on your system. For public for a private bug bounty program, the bug report is only shared within your organization. Next, 
you would want to consider the duration of your bug bounty program. Is it going to be ongoing throughout the whole year, just like a vulnerability disclosure program? Or is it going to be seasonal? For NUS, we choose a seasonal bug bounty program, three to four weeks a year between mid-August to mid-September, where our students are most available to research on the system and get their hands dirty on ethical hacking. Next, you would need to consider the types of hackers that you are going to open your bug bounty challenge to. Do you want to open your bug bounty challenge to members of public? Do you want to open your bug bounty challenge to only invited security researchers? Or do you want to open the bug bounty challenge to only members of your organization? For NUS, we open it up to both our staff and students because we wanted to expose our staff and students to ethical hacking. We wanted them to hone their skills on ethical hacking in a safe and familiar environment. For organizations with highly sensitive systems, like for example, MINDEF, they may choose to open the bug bounty challenge to only invited researchers. And other organizations may just open it to the public. Next, you need to ensure that there are sufficient interesting systems that has been put up for your bug bounty challenge. And this interesting system will then attract ethical hackers to invest their time on the challenge. For example, NUS choose transactional systems, systems with search at update delete functions, rather than system that has just pure static content pages. NUS also choose system that is internet facing rather than intranet facing. So all these systems are subjected to a higher risk of cyber attack. Next, we also choose system that is business ma major uh, majority of business essential systems and system that are about to commission or has just been recently commissioned rather than system that is decommissioned. All this would maximize the return of investment for the organization. In addition to that, we also choose system with and without registration, with and without 2FA, mobile application, as well as web applications. All this wide variety of system would provide an enriching experience for our staff and students for the ethical hacking or the bug bounty challenge experience. Last but not least, you would need to consider the triage team, the team who is doing the verification of bugs for you. Are you going to outsource the verification of bugs to a service provider? Are you going to insource to your in-house team or are you going to adopt a hybrid approach? If you have a large in-house team that is capable of doing trash of bug, you would want to do the trash of bugs in-house. Now, if you have a small team, um, and for example, in an NUS bug bounty challenge itself, we have about 31 bugs that's received over a three to four weeks period. This is going to take a toll on the in-house team who is really busy with their daily operation. So we choose to outsource the trash of bugs to service provider, for example, like HackerOne. For other organizations, they may choose a hybrid approach. For example, they would like to outsource sensitive, they would like to insource trash of bugs for sensitive system, and they would like to outsource trash of bugs for non-sensitive systems. Now that we have planned out our desired bug bounty program, we need to prepare a list of things before we are ready to run our bug bounty program. You can think of this list of things just like a shopping list. So first in your shopping list would be the list of systems that you are going to put up for the bug bounty challenge. You will need to get buy-in and approval from the system owner to put out these systems for the challenge. And if your system sits on the cloud, you will also need to get approval from the cloud service provider. Next, you would want to establish program rules with your ethical hackers. For example, you wouldn't want your ethical hackers to disclose the bugs even before you fix it. 
you wouldn't want your ethical hackers to disclose the bug without the consent of your organization. And you would like them to use dedicated VPN, virtual private network, so that you can monitor the activities and you can differentiate between what are legitimate activities and illegitimate hacking activities. On top of that, you would want to establish some moral codes with these ethical hackers. For example, they should not need to wipe out the entire database or extract the entire database when what they need to do is to just extract one record to demonstrate that they have exploited the system. They would also not want to conduct testing activities that bring down your entire system. Next, on the bounty pool and payout scheme, we rely on advice of our service provider. Now the bounty pool that you set aside, whether is it sufficient or not, is really dependent on the number of ethical hackers who are participating in our challenge, the number of system, and also the challenge period. For us, we choose to set aside US 24K. This is in line with the market rate. And for the payout scheme itself, for critical bug, we award US 1,500. For high severity bug, we award US 1,000. For medium severity bug, we award US 500. And for low severity bug, we award US 100. Besides giving our staff and students bounty, we also name them in our organization Hall of Fame, give them certificates and also marks for eligible module. Last but not least, on our shopping list to prepare for the bug bounty program, we need to have a checklist. So we need to inform the help desk that bug bounty challenge is going on so that they can direct the queries to us if there are any. We need to tell the IT support team on what is a whitelisted range of IP so that they know what is a legitimate hacking activities and illegitimate hacking activities. We also need to run through with our apps team for a number of things, for the preparedness for the challenge. For example, if they have an effective backup for the system, the system data, and if they have fixed all the bugs that has been identified during the validity assessment and penetration testing. So now that we have prepared the list of things, we are ready to run the bug bounty challenge itself. During the challenge, what happened is that the triage team and the bug bounty program manager will constantly monitor the portal. So the ethical hackers are going to submit the bug report to the portal. So the program manager and the triage team will then examine the validity of the bug and also the severity of the bug. For example, we will determine whether the severity of the bug based on the impact of the bug to the system and the likelihood of exploiting this bug on the system. Once we have determined that the bug is valid and also assign appropriate severity to the bug, we will then discuss with the application team. We will let them verify if the bug is valid. Once the application team further verify that this bug is valid, they will then discuss with the business owner and they will then decide on a timeline to fix the bug. Meanwhile, what happens is that the program team will concurrently update the bounty pool that is left for the challenge. What happens if the bounty pool gets depicted even before the challenge ends? So we will, do we want to stop the challenge or do we want to let the ethical hackers to continue the challenge by informing them that, hey, you know, there's no more bounty, but we can name you in a Hall of Fame. Fortunately for NUS, we didn't encounter this scenario. So this cycle of activities will go on and on and on and on during the challenge until we have verified the last bugs. Last question, how do I measure the success of a bug bounty? I look at three key performance indicators. 
First, I look at the numbers of ethical hackers who have signed up for our Park Bounty Challenge. I look at the number of valid reports that has been submitted for the Park Bounty Challenge. I look at the bounty amount that has been awarded during the challenge. I'm proud to say that from 2019 to 2020, all these numbers have doubled. So in 2020, we have 300 over ethical hackers who signed up for the challenge. We have 31 valid reports and we have awarded over US 10,700 South staff and students. Last but not least, now that I have shared with you on the benefits of a bug bounty program and how you can conduct a bug bounty program, I would like you to get started on bug bounty now. You can get started by first getting buy-in on a bug bounty program and then next plan for a bug bounty program. Prepare for a bug bounty program based on the checklist that you have just seen. And finally, run and measure the success of your own bug bounty program. I'd like you to share with me your feedbacks at this email address over here. Thank you, MC. I've come to the end of my talk. Thank you very much to Eileen for your presentation on delivering an impactful bug bounty program and the benefits it can generate. So let's take a look at some of the questions that we have for you, Eileen. Sure. So earlier on, you talked about planning and executing a bug bounty program and you've done so in a university setting. Um, I think we have a lot of educators here as well who are keen to promote cybersecurity to the younger students. So there is a question over here. Are there any simulated programs that are suitable for primary or secondary students? I think there are many uh, capture the flag competitions out there or even free tutorials uh, on how to find bugs on the system. So they can actually uh, Google more about it. Um, no, CSA has also been promoting a number of programs for the youngsters so they can actually uh, get on board one. So if they're keen to find out more, they can definitely head on over to the CSA website? Yes. Okay, so we do have another question here as well. In comparison to a pen test, what is the biggest difference between the pen test and bug bounty? Okay, for a pen tester, what happened is that this pen tester need to identify all the possible bugs that are found on the system. And for a pen test, the scope of the pen test may be limited. For example, the organization can choose to say, hey, uh, I want you to pen test these 10 functions, but not these two functions. Whereas for a bug bounty, it's really a free format. It's up to the tester um, to sort of like, you know, determine which functions they want to find the bugs on and there's no need for them to find all the bugs on the system, but they can simply find one bug, just one bug on the system, and they can get a, I mean, a valid bug, and they can get a bounty. So that's pretty interesting. And people are wondering as well, what is the biggest challenge that you actually face when conducting a bug bounty program? Or is there a specific, very rewarding moment that you have experienced in your, in your career while you were organizing the bug bounty program? The most rewarding uh, experience that I have is when the students and staff came back to thank us for conducting the Bug Bounty Challenge. So what happened is that they share with us through the Bug Bounty Challenge, um, especially you know with the wide variety of system uh, that we put up for the Bug Bounty Challenge, they were able to gain more practical insights about how to find bugs on the system. And it is also in a safe and familiar environment. And so that's where they get to maximize the learning. So uh, in the course of their learning, right, NUS also get to protect our system in a very forward looking manner. So that is like the most uh, rewarding experience that I have. In terms of, um, you know, doing a controlled bug bounty program, has there been any instances of um, you know, members of the public, enthusiasts, just reporting bugs in that sense. And, and how, how have you engaged this uh, public? Or are they open to a reward system as well if, let's say, people were just to report bugs outside of a bug bounty program? Okay, so far our bug bounty program uh, is a private one. So we state 
that you know the Park Bounty is only open to our staff and students. And what happened is that those staff and students who have signed up for a Park Bounty Challenge, we would then send them a link uh, to the Park Bounty portal that I mentioned earlier. This Park Bounty portal will list down the list of systems that we have put up for the challenge. And therefore, so far, we didn't have any cases uh, where public actually accidentally you know, or voluntarily uh, come to find bugs on our system during the bug bounty challenge period. Outside the bug bounty challenge period, uh, we do get uh, certain vulnerability reports, uh, bug reports on and off. Uh, many a times when we get this bug report, we thank them for finding bug on our system, uh, but we do not uh, set aside a budget uh, to award them a bounty amount. Rather, we can actually you know, just write back and say, you know, thank you for finding bugs on our system, and then we follow up on it. So do you actually recommend that people report these bugs on, on a day-to-day uh, why, basis? Uh, why not? Because it's like, you know, if it's better than this, these ethical hackers find the bugs and then report to you and you fix them uh, before the bad guys do rather than you let the bad guys find the bug and that would be like too late. Okay, so audience, you heard that? If in any event that you do, you know, uh, encounter a bug, you want to make sure to report it to the website. So thank you so much for sharing, Eileen. It was very thank interesting you. to find out how you can actually, you know, make use of hacking in a very ethical format uh, to prevent future problems from happening. That was a very insightful session. All right. Thank you. Thank you.